right. How are you, Finn? What's up, man? Not much. I noticed we're not on Riverside yet. <laughs> <laughs> I'm holding out for as long as I possibly can. Like, I, it's Zoom doesn't really bother me that much, although I know the editing would be a lot easier with Zoom. What bothers me is the equipment. I think if we knew the first thing about podcast recording, just in terms of like levels and mics and inputs, it would go a long way. Like, I don't know anything. I got all of these knobs over here on the mixer and I have no idea what any of them do. And I twist them around and I hope that it's going to make it sound better, but it, it never does. I want to start off by showing you something real quick that I think you are going to get a huge kick out of. Um, okay, so I am pulling up the most recent issue of my newsletter. I'm now doing it bi-weekly because I think I have the ad inventory to do it. Um, and so let me share my screen. This was the newsletter that I sent out on Wednesday. It's going to go out on Tuesday, but for now it's Wednesday. And check out who, uh, come on, who sponsored me. <laughs> you got to be kidding me. I'm dead serious, man. Yeah. For people listening, I'm looking at the cover of Tim Urban's new book. Yep. How'd you hook that up, man? It was ConvertKit. Can I tell you the most hysterical, ridiculous story about this as well? Sure. So Keith Urban, I believe, is one of the biggest people on ConvertKit. There's like Keith Urban and Arnold, um, I think. And so I saw Tim Urban. And my initial reaction was Keith Urban. He's a country singer. And he's like super, super famous, right? And I don't want to put anything out there that I don't know for sure, but Keith Urban is sober and he's been sober for a little while. And that's like part of his story, you know? And so they said, hey, would you be willing to sponsor Tim Urban? And I initially thought it was Keith Urban. And so I said, oh, wow, yeah, sure. That sounds awesome. By the way, like a lot of people know my history here. And also I have this other website called Sober Nation that's got like 12,000 people that I send an email out to every Friday. So maybe go back to him and let him know that I have this whole like recovery based brand that would really, really love his book. And then finally they got back to me and they're like, what the fuck are you talking about? So, <laughs> so when, when they showed me the cover, when they showed me the ad, I was like, whoa, this looks just like those stick figures on Tim Urban's website. And I was like, oh, wait a minute. Oh, man. That's hilarious. Yeah. So Somewhere Tim Urban is like, who's this fucking blogger who thinks, <laughs> who thinks I drink too much? <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's awesome. Yeah, I that's just cool, man. Get a kick out of that, and so that's, I wanted to show you. <laughs> yeah. Also, you know, shout out to ConvertKit and Nathan for like that's a cool, that's a real cool like sponsor to have in the network. That's a big pull. It's a big pull. Yeah, I mean, uh, they're doing the damn thing. I'm I'm trying my best to support them as best as I can. Whereas if somebody comes to me directly, like I, I do the right thing. I know I could just sell the ad and and keep the whole thing, you know, but. But uh, I always send it to them in hopes that they can close it and get their cut because they, they do so much of the legwork. Um, it, it's a real process. And I knew it was going to be a process going into it. Just, I mean, geez, you, you know better than anybody, right? Like coming up with the inventory and like consistently hustling and hustling to get um, new advertisers and dealing with the metrics 24-7. It's, it's a, a, a grind, but they're doing it. And I'm like super, super grateful about it. But yeah, man. Tim Urban, he sponsored my newsletter. He sponsors every Tuesday for the month of March. So I'm pumped Hell about yeah. it. Hell yeah. Hell yeah. Shout out to Tim Urban. Yeah. Okay. Well, that actually is perfect. Um, Cause I got something that I want to show you too. I'm, I'm excited about this. Speaking you need the of the screen. No, no, no. Just hold up to the camera. Can you read this? In case you forget. Whoa. <laughs> so this is the, this is, uh, this is my first book and it's, I'm holding it up to the screen for people listening. 
I'm excited for this. So I actually, I'll give you the backstory a little bit, but what I'm excited for is- Wait, wait, wait. Uh, hold that open. There's like words inside that book and stuff, right? This isn't just some fucking, <laughs> oh my gosh, you wrote yeah. a book, Ethan? Yes. Um, well, I published the book. I wrote the book. This book has taken me 10 years to write. Um, and I'll give you the backstory real quick. We, I think we've talked before on this show about sure. the, uh, I went through like a pretty- formative uh, experience with anxiety <clears throat> and um, one of the ways that I sort of started getting better after well I guess I'll step back for a second when I was 22 I suddenly came down with like social anxiety that I never had before mm -hmm. and it affected my life in ways that I just never would have predicted and it was tough it was real tough for anybody who's been through that before you know like you can't really logic your way out of it. Um, it can totally flip your social life upside down, your career, your family life, whatever. Um, and I went through all that, completely changed my life. And for a long time, I lived as like a shadow of my former self and eventually worked my way back to kind of the guy that I am today, which I'm really happy with and i had my careers in a like place that i love large parts of it involve socializing right so it, in my mind it was a very formative experience and uh something that i kind of wanted to give some meaning to so years ago i started writing letters to myself about the things that i was learning along the way in terms of how fear or anxiety affected me and how I dealt with it. And I ended up compiling them all into a very short book. Um, and I published it once years ago, and then I pulled it down because I wasn't super happy with it. And so what I did recently, I actually started this last fall, is I started working with a freelance editor and a book designer to just take the exact same concepts that were part of the original book, polish them a little bit, and repackage them in a way that looks a lot better and i'm i mean that's what this is so it's officially live it just went live Man. i think on tuesday so yeah, you're an author Amazon. and i believe the term is an auteur <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah i'm excited for it though man it's officially live and... hold it back up hold it back up what's so uh, it's what's that little red dude is that the thinker I'm really stoked about this. So this, I mean, there's more, there's more we could talk about in terms of like the, the process of putting a book out. One of the things that uh, people will probably notice if they're watching the video is that the book, this is no, it's not like uh, Shakespeare. This is pretty, mm -hmm. it's pretty, it's pretty thin. And that's actually by design. Um, when I wrote the book, the reason it's called in case you forget is it's, it's, it's really written for me. Because what I found over the years is like I would get better. And then all of a sudden one morning I would wake up just like yeah. with my pulse racing, you know, and it's like, oh, you start going through your head thinking, why am I anxious? Oh, it's because I'm not doing X, Y, and Z that I know I should be doing if I want to avoid anxiety. So I kept falling into this trap over and over and over again. And I would forget the things that help kind of like keep my life running the way that I wanted it to run. Mm -hmm. So I decided to write the book. And then I, you know, like a lot of authors, I'm sure everybody listening to this, if you've ever thought of writing a book, you get hung up on this thing where it's like, well, it's got to be, you know, book length. And that stopped me from writing for probably more than a year, maybe a couple of years. I can't remember now because it's been more than a decade since this entire experience sort of started. But at some point, I just decided like, look, forget whatever stereotypical ideas you have of what it means to write something book length. Instead, I want to write something that people are actually going to read and like yeah. that's useful to read. So then the idea became, I'm going to write myself something that I can use on those mornings when I wake up anxious, I can just pull this off the shelf, read it in less than an hour, remind myself of all the things that I've already learned that I should be thinking about and then get on with my day. And so that's really what it is. That's why it's called in case you forget. It's really it's written to me. Yeah. Um, and it's it's meant to be read inside of like an hour. 
What's your plan to sell it? Um, I, I actually have a couple of ideas. So it's going to go up on my website. I'm starting to take the website more seriously this year. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so putting like email capture there and I'll be promoting the book in the side page. Um, and then I'm thinking of advertising it in newsletters. Uh, and the reason I want to do that is sort of twofold. To, to be honest, I don't care if it sells that much. Uh, the book self-published didn't cost me anything. Um, so it will sell for as long as Amazon continues to exist. So it'll either sell now or it'll sell later. Like my reputation as a writer is just going to continue to grow over time. So I'm not really in a hurry to sell it. But um, I'm thinking about buying ads in newsletters in order to learn more about what people are charging for ad space these days. So mm -hmm. um, people who listen to this know like, I'm pretty obsessed with the newsletter space. And uh, I just thought it'd be interesting to like call a whole bunch of newsletters that I respect and figure out what their pricing info is, maybe test some of them for ads, see how effective they are. It could just be interesting. I don't know. It's, I've never advertised in another newsletter before. So Man. I'm thinking about doing it that way, but more as an experiment for how effective newsletter advertising is rather than trying to recoup anything on the sales. What did it feel like when the box came to your door and you opened it and you saw it? I was pretty stoked, man. Yeah. So this is, I, I think I, I'm not sure if I did a good job of highlighting this. This is actually this technically the second edition. So I mm -hmm. did, I published it once before years ago and I just, I never liked the way that it looked. Like I used all the kind of the default settings on uh, Amazon. And by the way, for people who haven't done this before, it, Amazon, I think it's just called Kindle Direct Publishing. They yeah. make it, it's super easy. Um, and, you know, if, if, if you don't, have like strong opinions about how it looks it's very possible to get these books out like pretty simply in fact i've got an aunt and this is somebody that i look up to as a writer um she she's an anthropologist and she does a lot of like historical research up in upstate new york um and as a way of sort of distilling all the research that she does she started a fiction series talking about like a series of characters um from like i don't know the 17th century upstate new york and so and she's published like i think eight books at this point all self-published all through kindle and they're interesting because they're all based in like super local history and research that she does um but she's a great example of somebody who doesn't like let a lot of the like the bullshit get in her way of publishing she like she writes a book a year and that's kind mm -hmm. of it and like the first books were okay they get better and better and better as she goes because she put the reps in um and at this point you know now she's i mean you, you were kind of joking earlier it's like you're an author now she's legit got like a half a shelf worth of books that she's published wow. on this topic so um it's definitely an, op an opportunity for people who like don't get in their own way i am thrilled with the design now i great never liked it before but i started working with here for people who are kind of interested um there were two tools that came in handy one is something called readsy have you ever heard of them never so it's kind of like fiverr but specifically for um editors editorial talent yeah. yeah and what a lot of people don't know is that editors there's like a really interesting thing going on in the publishing world because so many book imprints have gone out of they've gone out of business a lot of the best publishers in the world have had to lay off staff so like the best editors in the world are freelance now you can go hire them for x number of dollars an hour like if you go to readsy you can find the woman who ghost wrote gary v's books or or edited gary v's books and stuff like that uh, and these are people who were, they were there at the publishing house when these books were released. So you don't just get like their editorial eye. You also get their in knowledge of how the editorial, like how the whole process works, how you put a book out into the world. All those, a lot of those people are freelance now and you can hire them at like really great rates. 
so that's kind of interesting. Reezy was super helpful for that. Um, Would you ever ghostwrite a book? Like have somebody else write a book for you? Oh, um, no, I don't think so. Yeah. Would you? I, I almost did. Um, what's the guy who wrote the book? I hope they serve beer in hell. Oh, that's Tucker. Yeah, Tucker, his company, Tucker Scribe. Max. Yeah, yeah, Tucker Max, right? He created some kind of company called Scribe, I think. Yeah. And um, it caught my attention. I talked to them. They almost talked me into it, but I just had this whole last minute, like, cowardice feeling, you know? And it was honestly like a, like going on a date for like the fourth time and just being like, you know what? I, I can't do this. I can't even explain why I can't do this. Like you're a really nice person. It's not <laughs> you. It's me. I gotta go, <laughs> you know? <laughs> and that, that's what it was like. So, um, no, but wow, man, congratulations. That's, that's so inspiring as I mean, geez, my book's been four years in the process and I don't know why it's so easy to write and so hard to publish something that has a cover um it's it's definitely been difficult but that's like super super inspiring to see that and see your name on the front of it that's so cool thanks man yeah. it was definitely a nice uh nudge i think is you asked about what was it like when it first showed up somehow in that moment like the next one felt easier yeah yeah like once it's out it's like oh i feel like i could probably do this I could probably put a book a year out, you know, using this process. I'll give people a couple other resources that have helped me too. So the other reason that I really like this, again, it's the writing hasn't changed much. And there were parts of me, trust me, that really wanted to change the writing. The reason that I didn't is because it represents a version, like a, a version of myself that I don't want to erase by like editing it, right? So I feel like, in some ways, the things that I've written, not just not just books, but like articles, I guess just articles, they they represent a version of myself, my interests, the things that I'm trying to figure out, my voice through time. And it changes. Like you know this because you journal a lot. You can look back on years of writing and you can hear your voice change and like it takes you back to different points in your life. So there was a part of me that really wanted to change a lot of the writing. Um, but I, for the most part, I didn't. What I really changed was the design. And I found the designer uh, through, basically, I just uh, I hired the book designer who designed another book that I loved. So there's, um, are you familiar with the blog, The Art of Manliness? Yeah, totally. Cool. So he started a community a few years ago. I think it was called the Strenuous Life Club. And it's pretty cool. It's like basically just like a bunch of, I, I don't think it's male only. I think it's just like a bunch of, it's mostly dudes, but it's a bunch of people who um, buy into this idea that like doing hard things is good. And so they, it's almost like the Boy Scouts for grownups where they have like a <laughs> bunch of merit badges that you can earn. I love and that. They've got physical challenges and there's like online community and stuff like that. And their their book with the different badges badges in it, I just love the way that it looked. It I, I mean, I'll grab it off my bookshelf in a second, but it 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 uh it just like reminds you of another era, I think. And it was the right size and the right design, all this stuff. Anyways, I found the guy who designed that. His name's uh Philip Gessert. And reached out to him, just cold emailed him and said, Hey, I would love to like work with you on my book. I would like it to look exactly like whatever you did for these guys. Yeah, yeah. So um, yeah, man, really stoked for it. Anyways, thanks. And I uh I hope if there's anybody else out there who's like kind of thinking about doing this, Reed Z was one thing that was super helpful. And the other is um a book called Ape, which let me see. I actually haven't thought about this in a long time. Uh, yeah, it's ape by it's weird. That they're saying it's by Sean, uh, Sean Welch, but I thought this was like by, uh, Robert Kawasaki or Robert Kiyosaki. Oh, sorry. Guy, Guy Kawasaki is the co-author. Yeah. Ape stands for author, publisher, entrepreneur. And that's a, it's a great breakdown of how to self-publish. Badass. I love it. That's so cool. I like, I don't even know where to go from there because I just feel like what a, 
it's not even necessarily a crowning achievement. It's just like you said before, I always knew that when I got that first one out of the way, it wouldn't be so arduous to be in it where, you know, like you can do it. You know, it's kind of like the first time you run 10 miles and you're like, oh, okay, that sucked. But like, I could do that over and over and over again. And uh, that's just so cool. Yeah. I don't think I realized you were writing a book. Yeah. Well, it changed because what happened is at first, a lot of it had to do with my own journey. And I can't tell if this is a fear or a cop out or if it's me being patient, but my whole perspective on life and my journey totally changed once my son was born. And so it's like, oh my God, like I'm not actually writing a book about that. I'm writing a book about this. And so then it totally screwed me up in my head. And I just, I couldn't get out of it. I really tried. I was even working with a, an authorship coach basically. Um, and, and I have all the outlines and everything and I'm, I'm kind of going there, but what, what I backed into a little bit just to get this first one out of the way is sort of similar to what you're doing where I, in my head, it's called in my experience. And I got the idea at the same time, I got the idea of like how I'm sharing on social media where like, I'm not giving advice, I'm just giving experience. And there's been many, many times, even times in this podcast where I've referenced these like really breakthrough lessons that I've had mostly from men. And so there's a part of me that says like, there's a part of me that thinks I want to make it about the fact that it's like men who have taught me a little bit how to be a man. Um, you know, one of the lessons, for instance, my wrestling coach, Coach Ira, out of all the stuff that he taught me, there was one moment in particular where my team wasn't very good, but we were, I mean, we were in Pennsylvania and Pennsylvania is just like the hardest wrestling state, maybe Iowa and like Ohio is next to it. But anyway, we lost a lot. And my coach just got pissed and he said, any, for every time one of us gets pinned, we have to run a lucky seven. And a lucky seven is in the wrestling room. It's basically suicides. You start on one wall and the, and the walls are padded. So you can like jump up against the wall and kind of kick off of it, you know? And so one, one, two, one, two, three, one, two, three, four, all the way up to seven and all the way down. And that's one. And we had to run six of them because we got pinned six times, which is a lot in, in a wrestling match because of the weight classes. And I was always one of the best runners I wasn't the best wrestler, but I was always one of the best runners. And so I was done first and I was sitting up against the wall next to coach Ira. And all of a sudden he nudges me. He says, Hey, 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 like, do you see what just happened? I was like, what are you talking about? And there was a, a kid on my team. I'm not going to call him out, but we'll, we'll call him John. And John broke during it. He, he, he broke and you could see it. His arms were flailing. And he just wasn't there. His head was kind of kicking back. He was, he was too tired to go anymore. And Iris said to me, he says, he's no more tired than he was the one before. It has nothing to do with how tired he is. He just decided that he couldn't do it anymore. And, uh, and it just, it hit me. There's something about that thing where it's like, oh my God, it's true. He's not any more tired than he was the rep before. Like, quite exactly the same he's exactly the same amount of tired as he was before but just for whatever reason his brain snapped and so that's just one example but um what i'm doing now is i'm kind of formulating all of these these weird lessons that always stick with me as i was learning how to become a man and so there doesn't have to be like a chronological story. You know, I can kind of just piece them together. You can read them one at a time if you want to. And I'm like more comfortable where it doesn't have to be a set formula. Like I can just write this stuff down and then put it together and publish it. And like, here's, here's what it is, you know, but, uh, but, but that's what I'm working on. So I, I can't tell if I'm going to call it in my experience or if I'm going to call it something about like, like the men who taught me or something. The problem with that, but this could also be an opportunity is I got to get my mom in there because out of all the people I've ever met in my life, my mom is like the fucking toughest, like most hard ass person like I know. And so not putting her in there would be weird, but I think it would be kind of cool to have her as like the very end, like the last story, you know, hey, all of these big tough men who taught me stuff, just so you know, like you ain't got shit on my mom. Um, so that's how I see it. And it's actually coming together a lot faster 
than the other one did because the other one I just couldn't wrap my head around and, and still kind of can't wrap my head around. But I hope when I hit publish, it'll make the rest of it easier. I have, I have no idea. That's awesome, man. I, first of all, I love, I love the idea of uh, the, the counter, the point and counterpoint offered by your mom as a subject. Yeah. That's uh, that's great. I like it too. Yeah. And um, also just really cool. That's a really cool topic. I'm curious when you, when you write it, you, you mentioned that your mindset changed when you became a dad, is it written like to your son or are you just writing? Is, is it? Um... No, no, okay. it's not. Um, it's, it's just like, this is what I learned. You know, That's so cool. I'll give you another example. I don't mean to be on my high horse. It's just these stories. Um, when I was probably 17, I worked at this place called Tire Plus. It was, it was a mechanic. I, I fixed a ton of cars and we call it slinging hoops. You're changing tires. And, uh, this guy named Bernie, his name was Bernard. We called him Bernie. He was just the most typical North Philly, like Mount Airy dude ever. And when I was just getting started, you know how you're learning something and it's, it's like kind of frantic and there's a lot of steps to changing a tire. It's not very complicated, but there's like a whole lot of steps. And uh, I was just moving too much. And he, he always called me young bull. He goes, hey, young bull. He's like, try not to move around so much when you work. And for some reason, that was another one of those lessons where it's not just about slinging hoops. Like there is efficiency of movement in everything you do. And when my daughter was born, it's so funny how Bernard was the first thing that popped into my head because when my daughter was born, she wasn't breathing. And, uh, and all of the sudden, somebody pushed the button and this swarm of like three or four women or something came in. And I don't even know how to explain it. Like, you know, when you see somebody who's really good at working with their hands, yeah. even like a woodworker, there's just this beautiful like efficiency in the movement of their hands. And these four women picked up this little, little tiny baby. And granted, the consequences of dropping this baby on a hard tile floor, on a hard tile floor are like really, really severe. You know, like it's not a thing that you want to do. And they just so confidently and so efficiently pass this little baby around, not even talking. They didn't even have to explain to each other what to do. And when I saw that, there was this instant moment where I knew that she was going to start breathing because I, I thought of Bernard. And he was like, young bull, don't move around so much when you work. And the way these women worked was just so smooth and efficient and like this weird poetry of motion type thing. And so anyway, these are the kind of lessons that I'm trying to share in my book where like, I, I just see them everywhere in my life now that I've learned them. Dude, that's I love it. That's fascinating. Yeah, I I can't wait to like read slash hear more of these. Um, right. I'm curious. One thing that you've always sort of that strikes me about the stories that you tell is that these stories from your life seem to be very accessible to you. I I, I have a harder time if you were to ask me right now, like, what's one of the most important lessons about being a man that you've ever learned? I could think of one, but it would take me. I'd have to like pause, step away, think about it, come back and be like, here's what I got for you. Your stories seem to be much more accessible. Do you think that's because you're writing your way through them right now? Or like, why is it that these are so top of mind for you? I've always had a good memory. Um, <laughs> because my memory doesn't suck. <laughs> <laughs> like, it's, it's actually, and, and I hate to pull out a story about this, but I have to. Um, an ex-girlfriend of mine was in school to be a clinical psychologist. And when you get to a level, there's a test that you, you have to take. Like the, I forget what the name of this test is, but being one of the people that can actually administer this test apparently is a very, very lucrative thing. And mm -hmm. uh, you have to practice it because there's a real, like the practitioner of the test can kind of fuck up the results by reacting, you know? And so she used to practice this test on me and I'm such a klutz, you know, like I always had such a hard time concentrating and, and my results were never good. It, it was kind of an uncomfortable experience being tested this way, but um, doing the memory one, I remember her leaning back on her chair and I was like, what? She's like, you have like a, a genius level photographic memory. And I was just like, what? <laughs> like, I, I don't know what you're talking about, but you're not talking about me. 
Um, which is so funny because I can never remember where I put my car keys, you know, but, but, you know, every time my wife and I watch a movie or, you know, like I can basically recite the plot line to all seven seasons of Mad Men and Dexter, wow. which was eight seasons and like Homeland, which was eight seasons, you know? And so I don't know, weird stuff like that. I can always remember. It's interesting that you mentioned those because those are all story-based. It sounds like you just have like yeah. an exceptional memory for stories, which from what I've heard is like, I don't know, people will say that that's how the human mind is supposed to work. It's supposed to be, it's supposed to latch on a story and that's why you should have stories in your marketing and stuff like that. Like it makes you more relatable, but it's interesting that your mind is, you know, so good at remembering and, and retelling stories. That's super interesting. You ever seen that video where some guy was doing a, it was a psychologist and the video was, I mean, it was in the fifties. So it's, it's really low quality animation. And basically there's a square and there's a smaller square and like two triangles kind of bouncing in and out. And he played it to a bunch of people and they all said, what's going on here. And everybody made up a story about it. I can, let, let me pull it up because it's, it's fascinating. It's so hmm. fascinating. God, what do I even search for? Experiment <laughs> yeah. of shapes. Good luck finding that one. Moving and the story. It's I. I oh, bam! Here it is. Come on, are you serious? I'm dead serious. Hold on. <laughs> How do I do that thing that where the audio goes? When you computer? click share screen in the bottom left hand corner, <clears throat> it will say something like share audio. Same sound. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, check this out. Is this Flatland? Oh, no. Yeah. So he played this in front of a bunch of people. And they all came up with a story where the big triangle is trying, is trying to attack the girl, the, the woman. And the woman is the circle. And the little triangle is the one trying to protect the woman and like bend off the big triangle. And in reality, th th there's nothing. What we're looking at is a circle, a box and two triangles, but everybody saw this and they all came up with a story and the story oh. had characters and the story had a, a hierarchy. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. So I can the see big it triangles cornering, it. you know, the damsel in the castle or whatever. Another little triangle is climbing up the square and he's trying to open it to get in there. You know, he's got her, the big triangle, the monster has got the, the little damsel trapped. And now the hero is coming in and bam, rescued her. <laughs> Isn't that crazy? Yeah. Yeah. It's wild how the mind works because I could totally see it as we're, as we're playing through that. Mm-hmm. One of the things that interested me about um, your experience so far is that you've been writing this book over like a long period of time, long enough that you've changed as a person since like bef before you kind of started writing it. And I was just curious to hear a little bit more about how you navigated that, because I, I ran into the same thing with the little book. And I also ran into the same thing with the newsletter guide, which actually uh, I'll shout that out too. Last well, the last chapter of that finally goes live like tomorrow as well by the oh time people gosh. are listening to this yeah dude that was like that that's a real that's a real book that was like 300 pages of newsletter stuff it's all right. free you can find it over at let me just grab the link for people listening trends.co slash guide slash chapters you cool. can find that yeah finally wrapping that up and that was um i'm glad to see that published but that's the culmination of like two and a half years of research and writing and one of the things that was difficult that I kind of related to in terms of what you said was, you know, like you said your outlook, personality, whatever, all that changed at a certain point in your life. And it can be really hard to go back and look at an unfinished work that is partially prepared and all of a sudden not see yourself in it anymore. Yeah. So how, how have you navigated that? Did you like start writing all over again or? No, I've kind of ignored it. And here's my boy, Neil Gaiman, again, saving my life. Um, I 
I love to watch YouTube videos of Neil Gaiman, as everybody knows. One, because I love his voice and I love how he talks and his like strange cadence and how he talks. But two, because he's just, I don't know, some about the way that he speaks about the, the art of writing always really speaks to me. And he talked about how the graveyard book took him 20 years to write hmm. because what happened is when he was two, excuse me, when his son was two, his son was riding a tricycle in a graveyard and he got the idea about like, Oh, what would it be like if a little boy was raised in a graveyard and was raised by ghosts? And then he realized that that's basically what the jungle book is about. And then he thought like, Oh, wow, that'd be so cool. That'd be so cool. And it wasn't until his son got old enough that he left the house and that he became a man on his own, that it dawned on him that he was never actually writing about a little boy growing up in a graveyard. He was writing about life, about the transition of being a boy to a man and then leaving, you know, because eventually, I mean, I don't want to spoil it too much for everybody, but he, he leaves the graveyard, you know, he, he leaves safety. He leaves the little paradise of, uh, of seclusion. And when my son was born and I had just finished reading American Gods, which was very, very long and just one of the deepest, most complex books I ever read. And so I'm just looking at YouTube videos. I love to watch reviews and I love to watch all these review channels, both of TV shows and of books. And uh, the YouTube algorithm just served me this, uh, this interview with, with Neil Gaiman. And when he said that, it almost gave me this relief because as a writer and somebody who's like only real dream was to be a book writer, you know, not just a blogger, which in a lot of ways, I love doing a lot more than I think I would even love writing a book. But even still, it's like the only thing I've ever really wanted to, to say that I did in my life, you know, and it, it gave me this like, this relief, and this permission to be like, you know what, it's okay, because the story isn't actually done yet. And like, I'm allowed to just let it come to me and let it be and so that's that's what i've been trying to do but there's not a day goes by that like i don't think about it or i don't think that like i'm i'm hiding in fear or like i'm just afraid of of the page because because of all the reasons that we talk about on this podcast so much mm. yeah that's a i think one. i'm navigating it poorly to, to answer your question <laughs> <laughs> but that's what i got <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, I, I relate to a lot of what you said. I'm I'm kind of the same way where it's like I got this is I mean, this is the only book I've ever finished and it's 57 pages. So it's a, a low bar for a book. I've got three partially written books and I deal with that same sort of um, uh, resistance, which, yeah. which we talked about. And as I heard you tell that story, I thought about myself and then I thought like, oh, yeah, I'm doing fine. And then I thought. But Neil Gaiman was also publishing like a lot of books in that 20 years. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like like <laughs> he uh he had totally. some other stuff going on. So um yeah, I don't know, man. I I doing the little one definitely helped. And it makes me want to get started on the next one. But I I I've you know, it is tough when you when you write about stuff like that is personal just because of the amount of time involved in processing a book i really feel like i learned something and more so with the newsletter guide than with this weirdly even though this was much more personal the newsletter guide was more difficult to keep updated because a lot of the stuff that i talked about in this little thing is it's all evergreen you know like some of the some of the voice probably evolved i would probably say things a little bit different now but the points are all still the same um, the newsletter guide is much more timely because we're talking about an industry and, um, you know, how it works. And so I, like I originally wrote that, I think by the spring of 21, it was basically done. And then because of some back and forth stuff on the company, it got shelved, but we basically dusted it off in January of 22 with the plan of publishing it and then spent the entire year editing, updating, repackaging it. Um, and so I just got a really good look at this thing where it's like, 
I I would I hope nobody ever has to publish a piece of work that they originally wrote years ago. I, I don't know a better way of saying that, but it's like you gotta just you gotta write it and get it out because if you let it if you write it and let it sit for too long, you're gonna go back to it and it's almost like the entire thing needs to be redone, you know? Yeah, I think that is the ultimate fear. It's almost like the opposite of when you say everybody dies with too many ideas, right? Well, it's almost like every author dies with stuff in their books that they wish they could change. And, <laughs> and like, That's a great point. Yeah. And so we all, as writers, we all envision that masterpiece, you know, like it, you love Tuck Finn and, and The Call of the Wild, you know, like there's, there's nothing about those books that you would want to change. They're perfect. They're masterpieces. Um, and there's so many examples, countless examples. I mean, I remember, um, James Clear even saying that, and I've never read Atomic Habits. I read like the first third of it four times. And then basically was like, I don't need to keep reading this book. <laughs> you know? and you so, got a habit of reading the first third of Atomic Habits. Yeah, really. Because I was like, I'm going to get through it this time, but I, I don't know. It's, that's my personal opinion. But I remember one of his blog posts came out and I think it's still the most recent blog post that he published because he stopped writing articles and just started doing his newsletter. And uh, it was like a review. It was probably 2020, maybe even earlier. I can't remember how long ago that book was published. And he, he was just writing about how much of a grind the last four months of getting that book published were and how there's parts about it that he's unhappy with. And it's Atomic Habits. I mean, it's probably the best nonfiction seller of the last five years. I, I can't think what would be more. And even still, you know, James Clear, who basically like cashed out, you know, he's like the journey, the do he's like the don't stop believing of, of writers, like just a timeless book that's never, ever going to go anywhere. And he just cashed out on this one book. And even James Clear is like, oh, damn, there's shit in there. They're like, I just didn't nail it, you know, because you know if you nail it or not. And uh, I think that's everybody's biggest fear. And that's why most people never actually publish it because you have to be okay with the fact that it's it's not going to be what you dream it will be, which mm. kind of sucks, but is also the beauty of it, I think. Yeah, that's the reality of it. It's yeah. like um, that's what separates the people who actually do it from the ones who talk about it. We deal with this a lot. Like every industry, whatever industry you're in, if you're behind the scenes, you know, there's like a certain veneer that the world sort of has perceives of what it means to be in your industry. But then when you're actually in it and you're with the people who are doing it every day, a lot of the bullshit falls away. Like we, uh, you know, I obviously as writers or people who publish regularly, I think, you and me and and the other people who listen to this have a better understanding of that, right? Because that's sure. very, it's very like it's very um, I don't know, idolized or whatever. People like people make writing something that's a lot more sacred than it actually is, you know. And it's 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 it is important, but it's but it's just work. Same thing for entrepreneurship. Like, I think a lot of people want to be founders, and then when you're in it, you're like, this is the worst. You're just getting punched in the throat every day. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> um, so yeah, I think that's the, there is a difference between what people think it's going to feel like and what it actually feels like. Um, and I, you know, for the, for me, I get that in the process of doing it because I, I still fall into that trap. Like I have, this is the shortest book that I sort of have to my name. There are two others that I really, really, really want to write so far. And the um, the challenge with both of them is that they're both based on experiences that I had years ago. And I had I, I, I had those experiences specifically with the goal of writing a book about them afterwards. Mm. And at this point, it's just it's been so long that I um, I don't know if if it's still even the right move to write the book, right? So like the first one was, uh, uh, when I was 18, right after high school, I uh, spent, 
I think it was two or three weeks in a kayak paddling from Canada down to the Long Island Sound. So I um, planned this trip. It was me and basically one other friend. And we spent a bunch of time like living out of boats and traveling through the wilderness originally. And then you kind of move through cities and suburbs and all kinds of stuff. You see, I mean, New Hampshire, Vermont, Massachusetts, Connecticut, all the way down. A whole bunch of cool adventures, a whole bunch of crazy shit happened. Um, and I went there intending to write a book about it. And that was in 2008. And so <laughs> I've, I've, I've published pieces about this, um, but the book hasn't been written. And so now, you know, I'm, I'm, I guess, like almost twice the age that I was when I took that trip. And I, I mean, the simple answer is you can't write that book anymore. That version, I can't, I can't, I could, I could write something else, right? Yeah. I could look back on the experience, but I would never be able to write the book that I could have written at 18, having just finished that. And sometimes that could be good. That could be bad. There's, there's a lot of ways to interpret it. But the one thing I can't do is I can't just write like, Hey, here was my adventure that I took. It's got to be different now because I'm a different person. Um, the other one was a trip that I took in 2015. This was like, this was a kind of a big pivot for my career. I had been running a, uh, like a web developer shop and was really just burnt out on work too many hours, too little money, shut everything down and spent five months backpacking first through the, uh, Southern U S on the Appalachian trail. And then, uh, over to Europe for a few months. And I've always wanted to write the story of what happened on the Appalachian trail, because I actually went down there to retrace the footsteps of Bill Bryson in his his book are you familiar with a, a walk in the woods no. it's my favorite book of all time and my favorite part of that book is the very first section that he does in the in the like the southern end of the appalachian trail so sean will know what i'm talking about i'm sure um and i went down there and the things that the things that happened there were actually like story worthy i mean the way characters moved in and out of of my life and just weird connections between things that happen I still think it would make a great book, but that was back in 2015. And so I, those are the books that I carry around with me, still need to write. Somehow putting this one out, I feel like the AT one is the next one. Like it's the mm -hmm. bar just seems lower, you know, some of the, some of the perfectionism has like gone away. So I want to get that second one out this year too. So that's, this is like my informal uh, commitment to publish the Appalachian yeah. Trail book this year. Yeah, yeah. Wow. It's just, it makes me, what, what you said that writing is not sacred. I think that's really true. And I think we want it to be sacred because of the feeling that we all get when we read certain passages or we hear a certain song or, or, just just those moments where art captures, like I, I'll give you an example. There's this video of Sia, the singer, where she's doing the Saturday Night Live performance and she's doing it with a mime. And there's a mime right next to her signing the whole entire song. And there's something about that where I'm like, man, she just captured this emotion so well that it, that always gets me. But, but the reality of it is so much more about what you said, where writing is work just like cutting grass is work and just like being an entrepreneur is not what it looks like on it like when people say oh it must be so nice you can do whatever you want i'm like oh yeah like how about the crippling panic attacks at four in the morning for like five years when i <laughs> right like that was awesome but you know the, the work does pay off and so i, I think what I'm trying to keep front and center as I'm beating myself up, as I'm like oscillating between beating myself up for not writing faster and giving myself grace for just allowing the words to come through me and in whatever like the the muse allows. Um, I'm just constantly reminded that it's 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 such a metaphor for life, you know, at, at the end of it everybody gets to the same place. And at the end of it, the books get written, they get written and the ones that don't, don't. And you just, you have to embrace that, 
reality and that process and, and find the beauty in the thing for what it is, as opposed to chasing that like magical feeling that all of us get once a year, you know? That is such a good reminder. It reminds me of one of my favorite quotes. I actually just pulled it up here. Um, I think I've mentioned this book on the show before, but uh, The Green Hills of Africa by Hemingway is my favorite book on writing. And yeah. it's what it really is, is the story of a hunting trip that he took through Africa. Um, but he uses it as kind of an avenue to talk about writing in a couple of different places. And there's this one scene where he's sort of debating the writer's life with um a sort of a german tourist who doesn't really understand like american writers or american writing and i've always loved it for people listening if you just read that book like the green hills of africa i think read it over and over and over again and you can learn everything you need to know about writing i i constantly listen and re-listen to this book not only because of what he talks about but the way it's structured like you'll learn a lot about writing and structure and stuff but there's a, I'll, I'll read a quick passage in here, which I like a lot, which speaks to what you're saying. So they're debating writers and uh, Hemingway's character says, he's talking about American writers and he says, um, we make our writers into something very strange. And the other guy says, I don't understand. And he's, Hemingway says, we destroy them in many ways. First, economically, they make money. It is only by hazard that a writer makes money, although good books always make money eventually. Then our writers, when they've made some money, they increase the standard of their living and they get caught. They have to write to keep up their establishments, their wives and so on. And, they, and so they write slop. It is slop, not on purpose, but because it is hurried, because they write when there is nothing to say or no oops, uh, water in the well, because they're ambitious. Then once they've betrayed themselves, they justify it and you get more slop or else they read the critics. If they believe the critics when they say they are great, then they must believe them when they say they are rotten and they lose confidence. At present, we have two good writers who cannot write because they've lost confidence through reading the critics. If they wrote, sometimes it would be good and sometimes uh, not so good. And sometimes it would be quite bad, but the good would get out. But they have read the critics and they must write masterpieces. The masterpieces the critics said they wrote. They weren't masterpieces, of course. They were just quite good books. So now they cannot write at all. The critics have made them impotent. <laughs> and I just loved so that they quote. They weren't yeah. masterpieces. They were just quite good books. Yep. This is so true. <laughs> like, it's so true. There's something freeing in that, right? Totally. You know, the... The, the call of the wild is that really a masterpiece or is it just a really really good book Ugh. Hemingway the way he has those little short punchy sentences he he really was the model of me learning how to write that way with really short punchy sentences I, I wish because he could still take the the short punchy sentences and put them into just like that into paragraphs you know I really struggle with that um and I I think I lose like smaller arcs, you know, even just that one paragraph, there's a, there's a beginning and a middle and an end to it. I, I think I lose the ability to, to create the arc and even like a mini story, which is a paragraph. And he's obviously really mastered that, but, but gosh, what, what a great, they're not masterpieces. They're just quite good books. And if you must listen, if you listen to the critics and they say you're great, then you must listen to them when they say you're shit, which is so true. So true. Yeah. Great reason. I to like not engage on social media too, right? Like I, I think about this a lot, chasing the likes, the comments, all that kind of stuff. It goes both ways. If you if you buy into that stuff, when people say your work is great, it's gonna affect you when the opposite happens too. And I think uh, I think about this passage a lot. Do you ever hear the story of why it was that Hemingway developed that style? No. Actually, maybe you told me this before. I, I don't, I can tell you off the top of my head. I'm not sure. His, his wife lost all of his manuscripts. Either, and I, to be honest, <laughs> jury's out on whether it was on purpose or by accident. But this was like right about when he was having his first affair. So if you ask me, she figured it out. <laughs> um, and she was going, to, I think, to Germany to meet him. And she brought a suitcase with everything that he wrote in it. All of his carbon copies, all of his notes, everything. 
wow. on the train. And by the time she got off the train, the suitcase was gone. And so he lost everything. He lost, a, like, I think a book manuscript, a few articles, some short stories, everything. And so a lot of, and this was, you know, before he was well known. So he hadn't really published much. By the time he finally start, started uh, publishing, he had rewritten a lot of that material, but he had to rewrite it from memory. And so yeah. he didn't have time for like the flowery language, you know? So it was what helped kind of create this punchy, short um, delivery. That's so cool. Yeah. Yeah. What a great freaking episode. I think we're really, I'm, I'm really proud of you, man. That's so cool that you have a book with a cover with your name on it. And uh, I'd like to think, I know the chatting with you every week has given me a little bit of the invisible courage to, to do the things that I said I was going to do for a long time. Most notably my own newsletter I, I, there's no way I would have stuck with that if if I didn't have to fucking look at you in the face every Friday. And I, and I like to hope I'm not trying to make this about me at all. I just uh, <laughs> like, I know that this process has allowed me to, to do some of those things without putting huge expectations on it. So like, I, I hope that it all comes together for you. Yeah, dude, I'll be honest. I uh, envisioned this moment a couple of times in, in the yeah. lead up to it, in the lead up to it just being able to be like, sneak that cover on camera. Yeah. So, yes. <laughs> um, but yeah, man, I, uh, I, I, I have a blast doing this. And just whenever we get, whenever we get chances to like nerd out on writing, it's my, it's my favorite thing. I, you know, I don't want to talk too much about it because it's one of the things that you should just do instead of always talking about. But I really do enjoy when we get to just chat through like some of the real stuff on, uh, on what it's like to do that so you too. um i i guess what we should do is have the audience pressure you into publishing this year yeah i don't but know like, what do you think how far out are you at this point we'll not that here. far no not that far um it, it's got nothing to do with that it's got to do with the fact that every time i think about doing it i say i should be closing deals instead i should be work marketing my website instead i should be something which gives me invisible security for the future of like my health and survivalism, even though like I could basically stop working and be fine for five years. So not long. I just have to do it. All right. You heard him people. Yeah. Not long. <laughs> yeah. Cool, man. Right, man. Um, Perfect timing. I'm going to, this is yeah, going to be one producer. of the episodes where we can hit stop before the little, before the producer start screaming in my ear. So this is really good timing. Um, congratulations once again, Ethan. I'm, I'm really happy for you. I'm really proud of you. Thanks, man. Yep. All right, Thanks everyone. for listening, everybody. Yep. Yeah. You can we'll talk to you next week.